stories about water and urban places, this is ID Anthro. Hey everyone, and welcome back to ID Anthro. Coming to you today from Brad Dalrymple's hotel room. But more specifically, we are in Brad's hotel room because we are at the Stormwater 2018 conference and having a good time, it's the end of the second day. Yesterday, Brad gave a presentation about stormwater offsets and some work that you've mm -hmm. done recently looking into that in Queensland. So we're going to have a chat about that work and then probably get thoroughly distracted uh, <laughs> off on some tangents talking about stormwater offsets in general and our thoughts on them. So Brad, would you like to give the 10 second who you are and then tell us... Uh, Tell us about this project a little. Uh, yeah, so I'm Brad Dalrymple. Uh, I'm an environmental engineer. Uh, I've been in this game for about 18 years, would you believe? Wow. Uh, and you been... don't look a day over I'll 19. Play, play. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I work for BMT. Cool. Okay. You've done some work looking into stormwater offsets recently and what's mm. happening mm. around the place. What can you tell us about what you found? Yeah, so it was a Stormwater Queensland initiative. Mm -hmm. um, so we were asked to, uh, we, we took the initiative to actually look at the current status uh, of stormwater quality offset collection mm -hmm. and implementation within Queensland councils. We sent a, a bunch of uh, questions to uh, various councils about what they're doing mm -hmm. in the offset space. And we got those results back. Um, and it was interesting. So do you want me to go into the results as well? Or? Yeah, well, let's yeah. just, uh, I'll give people a tiny bit of context. So we're talking about the situation for quite a number of years mm. now. There's been legislation that means that most local governments ask the development industry when they're building new developments of certain sizes to meet stormwater treatment targets mm. and they build on-site treatment systems. And some local governments, yeah. instead of enforcing that on-site, offer an option where the developer can pay cash and the local government does something instead. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the context of that. Yeah, it's a voluntary water quality contribution in yes. lieu of on-site treatment. And strictly speaking, it's called an off-site solution and an yeah. offset. But we all know it's an offset. So. <laughs> yeah, that's true. What did the, what did you find in the results? Yeah, it was really interesting to be honest. Um, so we we got uh, the feedback was from the councils was there's four uh, four um, queen, uh, councils in Queensland that are currently collecting offsets yep. and and uh, spending offset money. Mm -hmm. um, three of so we actually asked some pretty simple questions to the councils in a, in a survey. Uh, basically, are you collecting offsets? If so, uh, can you answer some other questions? You know, how much money have you collected? Uh, what have you spent the money on? Um, have what sort of offset uh, pollutant load reductions would you have otherwise achieved on site? And how much are you actually achieving with these off-site solutions? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so we got three response. So three councils, Mackay, uh, Logan, and Ipswich provided um, really detailed responses to those questions. It was really appreciated. Yep, um, it would have been um, a fair bit of work for those guys, which was great uh, for them to provide that feedback. And Toowoomba Council. Uh, also, um, I guess acknowledged that they collect offsets, but um, couldn't answer any of the questions. Yeah, didn't have information available, no. essentially. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So, what were some of the key things that you stood out for you from the information you were able to gather? Yeah. What What stood out? Yeah. Look, we're talking. I guess first and foremost is the councils that are collecting offsets. It's it's a fairly significant sum of money. Um, so, for example, Mackay Council have collected about 1.25 million mm -hmm. since about 2014, by memory. Um, Ipswich City Council have spent about 7 million uh, on offset solutions, um, and Logan have, have, have spent, um, I think, about 3 or 4 million as well, or collected. I could be wrong with the numbers, um, but uh, and Toowoomba couldn't tell us. Um, and I guess the other key thing was um, look, councils that Logan, Mackay, and um, uh, Ipswich have actually spent the money on a number of uh, uh, projects to essentially provide those offset um, yeah. pollutant reductions. Which is just one question yeah. that's kicking around in the industry. Yeah. Sometimes people will level this criticism at these councils to be like, oh, yeah. they're collecting all this money, they haven't done anything yeah. with it. And that's the feedback we had. That, that's the reason why we essentially undertook, Stormwater Queensland undertook this um, survey because we were getting that anecdotal feedback. We're getting uh, complaints from um, various parts of our industry saying, Council, they're collecting all this money and not doing anything with it. Yeah, it might, be, yeah, might, be, yeah. might be going into general revenue. Exactly. Might be going to see stormwater benefits. Yeah, yep. yeah. And obviously that's not an outcome that really anyone wants. Um, but So we took the initiative of, of, of essentially looking at that a little bit further. Not just, not just wondering, um, but actually asking the critical questions that um, people want to know the answers to. It was a good timing in that um, the Department of Environment and Science have recently... Um, 
issued a guide, a draft guideline in yep. September of last year, yep. which is what's at now um, over a year ago now. Um, and that basically guideline outlines recommendations for councils that are uh, considering or currently collecting offsets in relation to what they should do in terms of planning, um, uh, yeah, equivalency, um, and monitoring and evaluation and reporting, yep. uh, et cetera. So, yeah. So where do you feel, so based on that guideline, and noting mm. that it's a draft guideline, yeah. That, yeah, so it's like it's there, but it's not set in stone by any means. How do you feel the local governments that are doing this are stacking? Up? Yeah, look, it's, it's outlined actually in the paper that I presented yesterday, which is probably, it will be available online as well. Um, if uh, I'll, 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 I'll Pick a snippet. Like, do you want to dig okay. into like okay. one thing that interests you or something like uh, well, that? So, well, okay. Well, I'll, I'll come back to the thing that really interests me. Okay. Um, but the really thing that interests me is whether I actually believe the offsets claimed by the councils. If I'm okay. Honest. So that's. Uh, well, but I'll put a pin in that for the time being. Okay. But if you believe the offset um, reductions claimed by councils, um, Logan City Council is 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 pretty close to complying with the guideline. Um, uh, in that they have achieved significant reductions in pollutant reductions, uh, so, so significant reductions in pollutants with their offset solutions. Yep. And they're actually significantly more than um, than they would have otherwise achieved on site. Yeah. So one of the things the guideline says is that if you're doing an offset, you don't just need to do as much pollution as would have been done on site, but you have to do 1.5 times yes, as much. True. So you're yes, saying right. Logan's pretty close to uh, 1.5. Don't quote me. I've got the numbers here, but That's it's quite, yeah. yeah. But uh, and Mackay. Um, uh, achieving it for some uh, pollutants, but not others, and mm -hmm. Ipswich are uh, getting close in terms of that ones to one ratio, yep. uh, but not achieving that. So they're they're falling short of the one point five. Okay. But it's worthwhile noting that the guideline was only released uh, oh. about a year ago. Well, this ago. is the thing: yeah. all all three of these councils have set up schemes with no guide, with essentially a policy that said you can set up a scheme, go for gold. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah. the reality is, like the fact that they have schemes that are getting vaguely closer would seem yeah. is actually a reasonable thumbs up I, to I, so. I honestly think it's a reasonable thumbs up. Yeah, I, I think that's a fair call. Like they, I, I think a key driver for the, the offsets, and we can talk about that if you like, but it's probably that they were inheriting uh, a lot of bad assets from development industry, and they were like, you know, there's a problem here. We don't believe that these assets are performing as well as they should. They're a significant burden uh, to councils in terms of maintenance. We want to explore the potential of an alternative arrangement and offsets is one option that is available to council under the legislation. So they've given it a crack. Yep. Um, and so, they've, look, they've, so they've essentially tried something a little bit different. Yep. Um, and you, you, I think that's a good thing in terms of this space, in terms of trying things. Yeah. Um, but with when you when you take on board that responsibility of, of providing a, a suitable offsite solution, you take on board that risk, and you take on board that responsibility to appropriately protect our waterways, mm. which are critical. It's not like uh, there's there's it's, it's not it's not a zero consequence game. Yeah. If we don't appropriately uh, offset, uh, there's going to be significant consequences to the, the health of our waterways, which are economically, culturally, ecologically, um, uh, aesthetically very important to everybody. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting one. It's, like, it's such a dilemma. Like, so we can, and this is probably the point where we're going to start to go a little bit away from your presentation yeah, just towards yeah, our, like. our thoughts. But, <laughs> like, but I think it's a really interesting one because I could make an argument that whether it's offsets or whether it's current on-site policy, none of our current policies are trending us towards a point where I'm, that we'll get, a, that we'll get waterways in southeast Queensland that I personally want, mm. I, it's likely that what we're currently doing is presiding over further decline in waterway Absolutely. health. Absolutely. That everything that we're doing is slowing decline, <clears throat> but we're still presiding over decline. Um, so, exactly. the, so, yeah. like, so, uh, yeah, so it's such a dilemma. Well, let's put a point on that. Like, okay. There is a policy. There's, there's, there's water quality objectives for all of our waterways within Queensland and yep. other parts of Australia. And the vast majority of them say, you have to at least maintain existing water quality. And some of them say you have to maintain and improve water quality. Yep. And as we, as you've just said, in, with the current status quo, we would expect a decline in the, in the health of our waterways. Yep. And that isn't good enough. And that isn't consistent and in, or in accordance with that requirement in terms of maintaining or maintaining and improving our water quality. Yeah. Simple as that. Yeah. But this is where this gets into the point of, 
affordability and are our current technologies good enough? So one of the ways I view this is that our current suite of technologies are like biotension systems are the flavour of the last decade. Probably. <laughs> flavour of the last decade, really. Yeah. And so I look at them and I'm like, great, this is a great first step. But if I do the sums for local governments in South East Queensland and look at to treat, say, the entire area of any 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 given local government in South East Queensland to the standard stated in the state planning policy mm. will result in an absurdly high annual maintenance cost. Mm. So I look at this and I'm like, okay, so our current technology, like, great, we've got these technologies, they're good, they allow us to do something for the first time ever, but they're not giving us, I don't think our current technologies are good enough to allow us to get really, really healthy waterways. I look at this and I'm like, that's a key reason why things like the state planning policy mm. don't go far enough to meeting, say, the Queensland Water Quality Guidelines. No, no. Because if they did go that far, they'd bankrupt. Like, I mean, they wouldn't bankrupt uh, us, but like, it would be really quite costly. I, 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 I disagree to some extent. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll use an example. Morton Bay Regional Council. Yep. There used to be a legislative requirement for all councils above a certain size uh, to um, implement uh, total water cycle management plans. Yep. And that was essentially not just looking at new development, but all all yep, contributing the factors yep. to, to the health of our waterways. And so Morton Bay Regional Council developed a, uh, a, a, a cash model for their entire region yep. uh, utilising a, a receiving water quality model and they essentially analysed a whole bunch of different scenarios, different cash management scenarios, total water cycle management scenarios to work out what they physically had to do in terms of capital expenditure and operational expenditure yep. to appropriately halt the decline in the, the, the water quality within Morton Bay. Yep. So they looked at a, a few scenarios, business as usual, uh, a little bit more, a little bit more than business as usual, and the bells and whistles, yep. like do everything. Um, uh, the business as usual approach, we know, we know from that modeling, um, is, will result in a decline in the health and water quality of, of Morton Bay. Simple yep. as that, yep. okay? And that's in accordance with all SPP, you know, legislative requirements. So the, the, st the status quo we know isn't good enough for Morton Bay, and I'm almost certain that the same would apply for everywhere else in Australia. Yep. So if we're just relying on new development to 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 um, improve uh, or implement best practice storm management, we won't get there. It's simple as that. But what we and what we even showed with if we do a little bit more than business as usual, we still don't get there. We need and the, the analysis we did for Morton Bay was that we need to pretty much do everything. Not at, like we need to do on-site treatment. We yep. can't just pass the buck. Okay. Yeah. We need to do on-site treatment, and in addition to that, we need to do a whole bunch of stuff. We need to do um, integrating um, stormwater treatment devices at a regional scale uh, in existing developed areas. Yep. We need to um, do rural best management practices. We need to do um, water recycling and, and reuse. Um, we need to do first and second order. Um, riparian vegetation, um, uh, waterway rehabilitation, the whole kit and caboodle. And if we do all that, we can appropriately protect the, the water quality within Morton Bay. But also, we actually know how much it's going to cost yeah. to actually do that. So Morton Bay has a capital expenditure program for the next 30 years on actually how to appropriately uh, protect the water quality within Morton Bay. Yep. And to be honest, it's not that expensive. Like it, Obviously, it costs money. But it's not prohibitively expensive. Morton oh. Bay have a plan to actually implement this, and it's not going to break their bank. That they, they, they can physically budget for see, it. See, I'd love to see it because I've seen other councils do not not to the same degree of detail, right? Because Morton Bay did the like that plan was the standing like the standout example of. A well, but why is that the case though? It, it, it was a legislative requirement for Morton Bay Council, as it, it was for every other yeah. council above, I think, 200,000 people, to do that. Morton Bay was the only one that actually did it. Yeah, they jumped on. I mean, but that can come down to things like champions. I mean, obviously, we know that... Lavania. And Lavania Lavosa, championed yeah, it. Sure. And, yeah, exactly. But I've seen exercises for other local governments that have looked at trying to get similar levels of treatment, and the perception is it will break the bank for them. Okay. I mean, um, I don't know if I, I don't know if that document's publicly available, so I'm, yeah, I'm okay. skirting around yeah, yeah, saying okay. who it is. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd love to see the. I'd love to look more carefully at the numbers but, for more. Uh, okay, look to see. But if we know that's the case, if we know we can't appropriately protect the, if if we yep. think we just don't have the financial and physical resources to appropriately protect uh, the water quality in our waterways, yep. 
as an industry, we need to put out our hands to say, we physically can't do it. So these water quality objectives that we're aspiring to achieve, what, what, what use are they? So this, this, this I do like, because I feel that at the moment we don't communicate. I feel that we should communicate honestly. Like I think the fact that if it's the case that at the moment we can't get to it, or maybe we can only get in, maybe Morton Bay for whatever reason, is in a good position and has they're, a chance to do it. They're in a better position than every other council. No yeah. other council I've seen has any sort of plan. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But maybe it's the case that if in some situations other councils, for whatever reason, aren't in a good position to do it. One of the things that bugs me a little bit is when we talk about current objectives, we talk about them like, it's like they were implemented as, ah, oh, yes, they're going to solve everything. Like, and we talked mm. about them. Oh, yeah, yeah. Whereas I think we should be talking <coughs> about this stuff because... Stormwater, the stormwater industry is evolving so much and changing so much. Do I feel that we should talk about everything that we do and every new idea as, a, as not the, ah, oh, this is going to solve it all, yeah. but as the, okay, this is our next best crack, yeah. and we think it's going to be better for these reasons, mm. but it's probably got these flaws, mm. Mm. and what we promise to do from this isn't to solve all the problems, yeah. but to learn. Yeah. And I think yeah. that change in language would help a lot. Yeah, absolutely. So another good presentation at the conference was Alan Hoban's talk yeah, about yeah. Um, how maybe music isn't representing our attention systems and all sorts of stuff. And one of the things I see there is, I think you know, Alan's work, and I know that you've talked lots with Alan and um, thrown ideas around with him, I think it would be easier for work like that to be received in the industry if everything that we did was framed up as this is our current best attempt. Because it then allows us to it's easier to admit where our fa- when someone points out the failings. When Alan says, "Hey, mm. e water, you know, yeah. music's not quite working the way this says." Mm. It's then easier for e water or someone like that to be like, "Oh, okay, fair enough. Well, that was our best yeah. attempt so far. Mm. Let's have another one." Yeah, um, I but think that thing, change in language. Who is actually uh, trying to improve science in our industry? Like, there's a, there's you know, you do a great job. You you go out there in the field and look at bioattention systems. And talk about them to the cows come home. It's fantastic. <laughs> I <laughs> am there obsessed. Is, there is very little. Uh, there is very little uh, information uh, gathering and sharing and, and utilizing that information to improve on the current situation. We What's talk that? about learning, but look at look at our technical design guidelines. They're twelve years old. Yeah. we know there's a few flaws in them. Uh, and look at it, like music. That's that that tool. It was great at the time, but it's. It's kind of got so um, almost out of date that it's almost its, it's usefulness is actually decreasing significantly. Well, that, and we're and that's still heavily relying on it. And that's something though that someone asked Alan at the end of his presentation was essentially, "Well, this is like this is useful. Like yeah. I understand what you're saying. What do we do next?" Yeah. And Al was like, "Oh, like I mean, yeah. clearly he's thought about it. Yeah. But there's not a clear answer. Mm. Yeah. To this, it's yeah. Well, actually, but, what how do what do we do? But mean, like, <laughs> meanwhile." Uh, the house is burning like the, our waterways are declining mm. in, in health uh, so it's not like something we can just pont- pontificate for the next thousand years and, uh, and we'll be okay with nothing happening yep. the time the time to act is now mm. and I honestly think as an industry we need to pick up pull up our socks and actually really change the way we're doing things we need to learn from our previous experiences and actually improve the way we do things currently because the current status quo is not good enough it's yep. as simple as that. Yep. And as an industry, I think we're, we're, we're more and more recognising the fact that the current status quo just doesn't cut the mustard anymore. Yep. We need to improve things. We need to improve things significantly. Well, and I think we should be very honest in talking about that as well. So sometimes I hear, say within, um, I think of a particular example of a local government, there's an un- like. I feel that we should talk very honestly to our politicians and our upper management about mm. this and, and actually just say, hey, look, you know what? Things aren't quite working in the stormwater industry mm. in the way we'd like them to. Mm. Like mm. you all know it. Like yeah. everyone in upper management see And we're back. We had talked so long that the battery ran out of the camera. <laughs> May not be the first battery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, what I was saying there was so I've I've seen situations within uh, say local governments where there's a hesitance to talk like the upper management know that things aren't working well with fire attention to, and the politicians know it. And instead of really honestly saying to them, you know what, we agree that it's not working, here's our way of provoking this. I've seen local governments where the reporting up kind of tries to downplay, it kind of tries to push that aside 
and keep mm. ticking along. And I think that has risks for the industry because because it because it's fooling no one. People can see what you can see either the waterway is not getting as healthy yeah. as quick as we want, or I can see not so desirable storm water treatment assets. I I agree with what you're saying that I favour a very honest and open communicate like approach to this communication, which is we've had a certain crack to date with doing water sensitive urban design and storm water treatment, and it's got these good things and these bad things, and we need to have another new crack because yeah. I think it actually avoids situations where you risk throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. Because I don't think, because I think if you don't communicate honestly about it, eventually someone's like, oh, for goodness sake, let's, Mm. like, what are we doing? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I I, I think, I think a couple of points on that though. Like, I don't think things, like, I think if we're purely relying on just the stock standard current policies in terms of compliance with the state planning policy, relying on the business quote, that'll get us good enough. We, We know that's not true, but at the same time, I don't think it's all doom and gloom. No. I think a lot of our assets, a lot, of, a lot of the solutions that we've actually implemented and are operating are actually in reasonably good condition. Yeah. Despite many sort of, we've probably made a whole bunch of mistakes. And, and to be honest, an overriding sort of issue is a lack of maintenance of these yeah. assets as well. So we, we've recently um, compiled a whole bunch of condition assessment um, uh, information on, on about a thousand different um, stormwater quality measures, bioretention systems, wetlands, swales, GPTs, yep. the buses. And look, a, ver- a significant proportion of those assets are not in a good condition or are yep. actually classified poor or very poor in yep. accordance with IPWQ. But a very significant proportion uh, and more are actually in a good condition. So yep. I think that's a really good success. But we actually don't communicate those successes. But also, one of the things we don't communicate is actually how much pollution uh, yep. these existing devices remove. We also don't notice some of the really good successes because there's some selection bias at play. So yeah, the story absolutely. that I like to tell is if you're... And this is really obvious. If you're in a local government that doesn't yet have an asset register and a budget yeah. for doing maintenance, and you're a, an officer in that local government, how do you find out about assets? You find out when someone complains. Exactly. So you see the bad ones. Yeah. And then you have another complaint and you see another bad one. Yeah. And on and on and on. You don't, unless you go and proactively find your assets, find the good ones. Mm, mm. And they're out there. Like I've had conversations, for example, with Ben Walker yeah. and... Um, Adam, formerly from Ipswich City yeah. Council, and they're like, "Yeah, we got good assets hidden yeah, away. Yeah, yeah, no one notices them, exactly. but we got them. The, the we got them." The, our success stories, uh, we're victims of our own success because they invariably beautifully integrate within the urban environment. Yeah. They just look like a, a, another vegetated garden bed or something similar. Yeah, um, but we don't often, to be honest, we don't communicate that because we kind of move on to the next project. Um, but I honestly think that kind of information needs to be shared to the, the powers that be that are, yep. that are receiving all of the complaints. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. another classic example of this, and we're getting thoroughly off the original That's topic, right. and it's fine. <laughs> another classic example is, is a local government which implemented lots of grass swales in residential areas in the late, late 90s and early 2000s. I know who you're talking about. Yeah, of course you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> but again, I'm being... Mysterious. Yep. Uh, local government implemented lots of these swales. Yeah, I, you know, I, a number of them had problems. Sure. Right? There was some flooding issues. There were some problems mm. with them. Mm. That local government went and outlawed, essentially, yeah. grass swales in residential areas yeah. in front of properties. Yes. That local government, sometime later, after doing that, went and developed an asset register, realised that they had some thousand grass swales, mm. and what's more, 90% of them yeah. were in really good condition. Yeah. And why were they in good condition? Because they were being maintained by the property owner. Yeah, and because they, they were, were getting maintenance. And because they were congruent with the landscape, yeah. etc. So they'd accidentally outlawed their most yeah. successful ever stormwater treatment. And that's measure. a classic example. Because they didn't yeah. have data. We, 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 don't, we don't have that. We're not, we're not doing a very good job of actually collecting that asset condition data. Yeah. We don't, we, even with those swales, we don't collect any information or share any information about how much pollution or how much uh, they contribute to improving our waterways. Yep. So that information is just not there. So it's very easy to actually get a couple of complaints and go, oh, us whales suck, let's get rid yep. of them all. And yep. I honestly think that's been a key driver for the offset, getting back to the offset discussion, yes. is that um, a key driver for uh, councils choosing to collect offset contributions instead of requiring on-site treatment are the uh, anecdotal reports um, of potentially a small percentage of, of overall contributing assets that are actually are in a poor condition, uh, and that, and that's that's what they hear and see, I guess, in a more day to day basis. You yep. don't hear about all the successes, yeah. Um, and that so they get all these complaints about these assets and go, well, obviously, 
wuss it yeah. isn't working, we've got to do something else. Yeah. Uh, instead of actually realising also, you know, it's still early days in this space. Uh, like, we've been doing it for maybe, I don't know, 15, so, 15 or so years. Yeah. Um, you'd expect if you're doing anything for the first time, you're going to make mistakes. Well, and this is why I like the idea of the honest conversation. I'm not yeah. talking about it as this thing's going to solve all our problems, yeah. but talking about it as yeah. this, is our, this is our current yeah. crack at it. Yeah. Because it allows us then to admit the mistakes. Yeah. Whereas if, you, if you're talking about it as, oh no, this is the solution, yeah. you can't admit the mistakes because then you look silly. Yeah, yeah. You're right? So this is why I'm really keen on a language yeah. change at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, Look, we know this is the right thing to do. Like, from the bottom of my big vegan heart, I know this is the right, I know this is the right thing to do. Yeah. We need to be treating runoff at the source if we can. I agree. Um, and I honestly think we need to be looking at... I, I, think, I don't want to be seen as being anti-offsets. I think they provide a good level of flexibility. Well, this is a question I wanted yeah. to ask you in a minute, yeah. which is, you said to me, like you said in your presentation, that you're not actually anti-offsets. No. And I want to dig into that. Yeah, but, sure. If for no other reason than... If you asked me three or so years ago, I argued really quite vehemently against offsets. And I now see a reason for them. Mm. And I think based on our chat last night and mm. stuff, it's prob- it may well be a different reason to you. Mm. But I'm interested to explore this. With you, so what's what? Where do you see their position? So uh, I honestly think it's good for councils to have some, and it's good for developers to have flung some flexibility in uh, pr- appropriately protecting and cost effectively protecting the health of our waterways. Mm-hmm. Like it almost makes no sense if you've got a string of developments on, uh, on, a, on a site that's highly constrained with the topography or whatever other uh, reason, and they might, for example, uh, be discharging to an area which is perfectly ideal for a regional wetland, for example. It would make very limited sense to say, oh, look, you've got to do on-site treatment. You're going to have to have 20 galley baskets and, and 30 cartridge systems and when it discharges to a, 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 an asset that could provide equal or better water quality outcomes, in addition to providing a whole bunch of other outcomes in terms of improved amenity, et cetera, and also be significantly uh, cheaper. It'd be crazy not to have that flexibility. So in that regard, I think offsets do have their place. But where I think they're currently uh, operating is that they're seen as an easy way out. They're just like, we don't want on site. We want it, we just don't, regardless of the site constraints, regardless of the site opportunities, we really just prefer if a developer would just pay the money and, and we'll do something with it because yep. we just don't want to inherit any assets. Yep. I think that's where I think a lot of offset um, uh, uh, planning and implementations undertake. Like that's, that's the current status of offsets in my mind. Yeah. I don't think that's appropriate. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I tend to agree. I mean, I can sympathise with, you know, because I worked at Logan City Council at the time that offsets started being talked about. I can sympathise with, there were a lot of bad assets at Logan and Mm. they were in the public eye. Mm. Like, I can sympathise with how that scheme got developed, Mm. but I, um, the reason why I initially was very much against offsets was because when I look at the picture of, say, what somewhere like Logan would have to do to actually protect its waterways an offset scheme in my mind simply can't get there because no. I think it needs at sort. Well, it's like what you said with Morton Bay. Exactly. It needs everything. And that's, that's, my, that's my number one reservation with offsets is that I don't mind providing that flexibility, but there's a real risk that you're passing on when you collect offsets and, and take the responsibility to spend it somewhere, yep. you're taking on, the council is taking on board a lot of risk and it's also taking on board uh, responsibility uh, to appropriately offset that uh, contrib- that, uh, that offset that uh, well, pollutant re- removal, and it's also the chances of actually appropriately protecting and and potentially imp- or improving the water quality is significantly decreased because you all of a sudden removed a pretty potentially key um, aspect of a total water cycle solution. Well, and the other thing I can see, so I remember years ago, um, Andre Taylor used like around change. Andre Taylor described. Um, an analogy to me around change is like a pressure cooker, mm. right? So, so change is going to happen when things aren't quite gelling and quite working mm. right. But you don't. So, and when that's not happening, you don't want to completely jam the lid on. I'm, no. I might be slightly butchering the analogy here, so forgive me on. <laughs> you don't want to completely jam the lid on because that's essentially denial, right? Like, yeah. and it's just going to build up yeah. more and more pressure and it yeah. explode in your face. But on the other hand, though, you don't want to completely take the lid off because all the pressure disappears and all mm. the impetus, the good impetus for change. Yeah. And so I can see a risk of offsets taking too much pressure out of the system. So, yeah. so say for somewhere like Logan, 
there were plenty of there was plenty of pressure there, plenty of yeah. assets that weren't desirable. Yeah. There were some good ones for sure, yeah. Yeah. but plenty of assets that weren't desirable. I see in a situation where you know we're talking about needing, where ultimately need to do a bit of everything. Mm. I feel that offsets might take a little bit too much pressure off. So suddenly there's no impetus to do a bit of everything because no. it feels like we're kind of yeah. doing okay. Yeah, we're doing okay. Like we, we put in a few uh, improved farm management practices and we do a few wetlands that, that, that look and great. They, and they're not. Like, yeah. And as individual projects, they're really nice. They're really good. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I don't want to take anything away from projects like uh, Red Bank Recreational Reserve and Jim Donnell and, and Small Creek. I think they're great projects. Yeah. But are they, are, they a, are they enough to get us over the line in terms of appropriately they're protecting not, the, yeah. the water, water quality? As, pro, as projects, yeah. they're awesome as yeah. complete solutions to our yeah. problems then yeah. they're not it so yeah. that could be part of it but they're yeah. not it um okay let's uh before we wrap this up we put a pin in something about 15 uh, minutes ago yeah. which was uh like a bugbear of yours yeah which yeah, bizarrely yeah. we've not actually talked about yeah. so far we'll so, full circle yeah so back to this yeah, pin. so what a, is it? a key concern of mine in, in this offset space is uh and if you look at the, the three councils that are collecting offset money and spending it uh, well, the three of that actually give us, given us answers for those questions that we proposed. Um, each three of those councils is is offsetting the lion's share of their pollutant load reductions requirements with one project east. Mm-hmm. Uh, one project east uh, each. Sorry. Yep. So with Mackay, they're using um, uh, McLennan's Farm project, which is uh, improved farm management practices to to essentially offset the majority of their pollutant load obligations. Yep. Um, for um, Ipswich City Council, a, a very large portion of their pollutant load offsets is is associated with the performance of Small Creek, yep. which is a 1.6k creek revitalisation project. Yep. And for Logan, uh, the vast majority of their pollutant load offsets is with um, the Blackall Street wetland. Um, now, just to give you some of these numbers, so um, uh, Mackay is claiming 240,000 or thereabouts kilograms of TSS per year being mm-hmm. removed. Um, and and the, the the analysis that sort of backs up that performance claim, I, I honestly, I, 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 I struggle with its accuracy, if I'm honest. I, 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 I've looked at the sort of reports that uh, apparently support the performance claims, and I'm just not convinced um, that the science is appropriate to justify those claims. Yeah, did you make a comment in your talk along the lines, comparing the amount of rigor that had gone into that science yeah. to what proprietary yeah. stormwater treatment manufacturers yeah. are asked to so do. So for example, the performance claims of that improved um, farm management practices, which again, I think is a great outcome. And yeah, I, it's I a, like, it's a good credit. thing to be doing. Yeah, like, absolutely. And total credit for Mackay Council for giving it a crack and showing some innovation and actually trying something that, that, that could actually provide significant offset. Um, but the performance claims seem to be largely based on an, an analysis of one rainfall event, which is a simulated rainfall event, looking at a 2% annual exceedance probability mm-hmm. uh, event. Um, and I've looked at that event and extrapolated that the performance on that one event and um, basically uh, extrapolated it to give an average annual pollutant load reduction. Yep. And so that's looked at one rainfall event and extrapolated that to give an average annual load reduction. Yep. Which, if you look at Squid Ebb, yeah. there's, there's at least, I think there's 12 qualifying events that you need to do. There's a whole bunch of analysis that goes with it. That's that's really rigorous. If, if one of those yeah. manufacturers turned up to a council with one rain event and yeah. tried to get their product approved, they would be laughed out the door. Exactly. And yeah. that's just a concern. I still maintain Mackay total credit for trying something different and showing some innovation. Mm. And look, if anything, it might actually... Uh, work better than what they even they predict or what their their consultants predict. But the problem but, is we can't know. Yeah, the the science is a little bit grey in my mind. Yep. Bl- bl- um, Small Creek. Um, so, uh, the midline share of if city councils pollutant load reductions is due to Small Creek, uh, and off the top of my head, it's something like um, eighty one ton a year of TSS being mm-hmm. removed every year um, by this project, which was again it's a con- there used to be a concrete invert channel. Um, uh, 1.6k long, and they basically um, revitalised it to make it more natural. Yeah, I, I, I used an analogy that's something like the equivalent of your body yeah, weight every yeah. what, about a meter and a half. So yeah. it's basically removing about I'm about 75, 80 kilos. So it's basically removing my weight in dirt every meter and a half every year. every year. Uh, so that's again 81 ton of dirt somehow being physically removed out of that waterway. Yeah, where's every it all year. going? Where's it all going? And, yeah. and I totally if 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 the council are going down there with. Forty uh, two-ton trucks every year, and removing that dirt 
fantastic. Proof's in the pudding. I don't, honestly, I don't believe the numbers. Okay. Yeah, I mean, when you, um, when you made that number real in the presentation with the analogy of your body weight, yeah. I was like, hmm. Yeah. You imagine me lying down every metre and a half. And it's just, yeah, exactly. It would look a bit odd. Uh, but if you look at the Black Hole Creek threat, uh, Black Hole Creek threat, Black Hole I'm going to pull you up. Black Well Street. Black Well, sorry. <laughs> yeah, Black yep. Well Street wetland. Yep. Um, it's a, it's it's claimed to be something like removing 90, uh, 91 ton a year or ninety three ton a year of TSS. Yeah. I mean, come on. It's a it's it's a it's a it's a it's a wetland. It's a decent sized wetland. You know it better than me. Yep. It's got an inlet pond. Uh, well, it's, well, it is the whole site. I mean, ultimately, there's some biotension. So it's yeah. it's a big flood detention basin which has a sediment pond that splits flows into a wetland that's not yet planted, a bio, one biotension cell that has been planted, mm. and two future ones that are not yet built. Yeah, and not part of the, 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 the offset plan, uh, the, that offset money that's been spent isn't part of that um, future scenario. Okay, right, but fair enough. Here's a question for you. Do you honestly believe that that system would remove something like 90 plus ton a year of TSS every year? Um, I, I wouldn't have, knowing how to answer I probably would have said yes until I heard your small creek analogy yeah. and that suddenly made 90 me tons. nervous 90 tons that means a lot right? That's, so if Legacy Council um, would have to be going in there with um, 45 two ton trucks and removing that dirt every year yeah. Is that, did, it seems like that, it seems like a large amount yeah. it seems like again, a large I, I, look, I, again I, I like the approach of um, of utilising uh, uh, alternative off site solutions but reality is Water quality is a state interest. We have these water quality objectives to protect and improve our, our downstream water quality. Uh, it's great that these um, um, initiatives provide a whole bunch of benefits, amenity, recreation, ecology, um, whatever, yep. uh, improved uh, farm efficiency for the Mackay example. Yep. But fundamentally, they're, they're supposed to achieve a, a, an appropriate water quality outcome as well. Yep. And that's the key driver. And that's where the, the money for this pro these projects that's their, that's their requirement. It has to achieve these water quality offset requirements. And for my mind, I don't believe the numbers. But this, but this is where this gets, for me, gets a little scarier. And this really only works with the Logan analogy. But in the Logan case, and I know it because I project managed the design of the Blackwell Street wetland. Yep. And I left and Dan Carrick did a great job in managing to get that thing built <laughs> on a... Um, on a bit of a shoestring budget in the end. So full credit to Dan mm. for making that happen. Um, but if you look in that case, those pollutant removals that they're claiming, yeah. to the best of my knowledge, have been generated using music. Mm -hmm. uh, Mackay wasn't. But, but no, yeah, no, 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 yeah, yeah, shop. But, but I'm just yeah. talking about Logan, yeah, Logan because okay, this yeah. is the most like for like yeah, example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those have been generated using music, but then our estimates of what would happen on, with an on-site treatment system are generated using music. Mm -hmm. So if we're really concerned about the numbers being generated for Blackwell Street, as a regional system with music, it should make us question what's estimated by any on-site system sure. as well. Yeah. Which starts to question the whole foundation totally of our agree. objectives. Totally agree. The, 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 when you, went, you asked that question of me in yep. the presentation, and the, my response then and it remains is, two wrongs don't make a right. Just because we've got a, a, a cloud of doubt over the performance and my, of on-site treatment. And my response was two wrongs might make a bigger wrong. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and I, think, I think when we actually integrate bioretention or, or whatever on-site solutions or uh, local solutions, that they're, they're doing something, um, whether it be improved hydrology or improved water quality to some, to varying extents. It, it is highly variable, obviously. Yep. Um, but when you, when you take all those, um, I guess, distributed approaches and assets that are providing some sort of local water quality benefit, uh, recognizing that it's probably a bit of a doubt over their performance, and you put all of that money into one, or at least a, a large, a very large yeah. egg basket, if that egg basket is dropped or for whatever reason doesn't work as well as you think it does, that's a big risk. Yep. And my, 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 my query to council would be, why would council want to take on board that risk? I honestly don't understand it. You, you take on board the, the responsibility and risk associated with the performance of local assets, which has been designed, um, constructed, etc., by private uh, individuals, external to council. That risk is kind of more on them. And eventually, you, you're responsible for maintaining that asset. That's cool. You accept yep. an element of that risk. But when council takes all the money in offsets, let, lets the local um, uh, solutions basically not happen, 
and takes on board that risk to actually do something to appropriately design, implement, establish, and then subsequently maintain an asset. That's a huge risk. And I honestly just don't, can't understand why council would want to play in that space. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. I mean, what this really, yeah, it just, for me, like it looks, uh, and so this is something I've talked about with, um, yeah, with people at Brisbane City Council about is it feels that at the moment the sort of decisions that people are making about you know do we look at offsets or do we on site stuff in this way or do we do this or do we do that it feels that at the moment that it's a case of not what's the right thing to do but what's the least bad thing like essentially yeah. like yeah um like saying we can't get this perfect right now so what's the what's the least what's the thing that's the least bad and the thing that's most likely to track us in the right direction. Mm. Um, that to me feels like the way to, particularly the, what do we do to track in the right direction? Yeah. Um, for me, feels like the right way to approach and to try and the right, deal with this And this stuff. comes back to this total water cycle management stuff. Yep. We need a direction. We need a plan. And, and, if, mm. we, and if we want to, the ultimate goal is to the best of my knowledge, at least according to state government water quality objectives, is to protect and or improve our water quality. Yeah. It isn't currently we're gonna accept a decline in water quality. Yeah. That's our goal. Regardless of what yeah. me and you talk about, that's our goal. Well and so, for me and for me personally, yeah. that's the goal. I mean yeah. I subscribe to enhance. And that's our yeah, exactly goal. and, and that's, that's the expectation of our community as well. And there's a lot of uh, economic uh, ecology amenity reasons why that, that goal is there. Yeah. Okay. What we need to do is actually appropriately have an appropriate strategy to achieve that goal. Yep. Total agree. water cycle management planning is or provides that. It provides uh, a very good framework. Exactly, yep. and, and it used to be a legislative requirement. My my recommendation is bring it back in. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, or if a local government, I mean, if if someone's been sitting here watching this and like, yeah, this makes sense. There's nothing to stop a local government doing it themselves. Yeah. you just have to make the case internally yeah. that it makes sense yeah and even in That's, the absence of a legislative requirement like Norton Bay Regional Council saw significant value out of it like they were looking down the bat like they probably did a similar um, study to the one you were referring to before they looked at how much they need to spend to appropriately protect the water quality and they did it on a bioretention um, analysis that had well we need X amount of bioretention which is going to cost us squillions to do yep. oh my goodness that's going to cost us a fortune but what they did one of the outcomes was out of the TWCMP the Total Water Cycle Management Planning um, was the actual overall strategy is a lot cheaper than what we uh, originally anticipated. Yeah. So the economic incentive um, to do total water cycle management planning really came to fruition. It, whilst the original um, driver was probably, uh, at least in part, legislation, yeah. the real benefit that council saw was the economic benefits associated with it. Yeah, yeah, because it's given them some detail, like a path to pursue that ultimately is probably going to be cheaper than just yeah. the default, let's build a bunch of buyers exactly. with no real plan. Exactly, and allowed them to develop and subsequently uh, plan for the most cost-effective approach to protect Morton Bay. Yep, I like it. Okay, this is a good spot for us to, to wrap this up. And cool. I am, I'm very grateful, Brad, for taking the time to have a chat. Pleasure. This, this is the sort of thing that I like. I want IDN3 to be, which is like spitballing ideas yeah, around yeah, and just great. chatting. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so thank you. We better get our suits on and go to this awards night. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> to absolutely. It. Cool. Well, thank you, Brad. Thank you, as always, for tuning in. We will see you next time and hopefully with some more chats coming out of this conference. Yeah. Cool. Have a good one. Before you go, our best episodes come from your questions. This knowledge base, these discussions that our ID intro improve with your contribution. So if there's a topic, an idea, a concept that you would like us to explore, Come and ask us. You know where to find us. www.ontheanthro.com slash contact. You can find us on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and that place you get your good podcasts from. You know where to find us. We look forward to hearing from you. We'll see you soon.